We're going to be in chapter 10 tonight in Genesis, and um, would you stand with me as we begin reading the entire chapter? And I know this is going to hold you on the edge of your seat as I read through this, because I know how much you guys love genealogies. It begins in verse 1. It says, this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons who themselves had sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Madai uh, Java, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, the Kittim, and the Rodanmen. And from these, the maritime people spread out into the territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. And the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim, Put and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabat, Sabta, uh, Ra'ama, and Sabteca. And the sons of Ra'ama were Sheba and Dedan. And Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the first centers of his kingdom were Babylon and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in Shinar. And from that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Ur, and Kala and Resen, which is between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. And Mizraim was the father of the Ludites and the Anamites and the Lahabites and the Naphtuhites and the Parthrusites and the Kazluhites and from, from whom the Philistines came, and the Kaphtarites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvadites, Zemorites, and Hamathites. And later the Canaanite clan scattered, and the border of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar as far as Gaza, and then towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. And sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber, which is where we get our word Hebrew. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. And the sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, uh, Gether, and Meshech. Arphaxad, and all, who was the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because in his time the earth was divided. And his brother was named Joktan. And Joktan was a father of Almodad and Shelef and Hazar Maveth and Yeref and Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimael and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. And all these were sons of Joktan. The region where they lived stretched from Mesha towards Sephar in the eastern hill country. And these are the sons of Shem by their clans and their languages in their Torah territories and nations. These are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Whew. So if you're expecting a child, you have a list of names to choose from. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I, we thank you for your word. And even though it may seem a, a bit pedantic to go through a list like this in the genealogies, I believe with all my heart, God, that you said every word mattered, that you said not one jot or tittle would be removed from your word, that it's the everlasting word of God. And our whole purpose of this series of studies is to confirm that even this portion of the Bible that is really disregarded by so many today is still the Word of God and is still the Word of truth, and that's why we seek to reaffirm those facts in our hearts and our minds tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said, uh, <clears throat> even in my prayer, and I've said many times before, that one of the things that is my objective in this study of these first uh, 11 chapters of Genesis is to really kind of anchor in our minds and our hearts the idea that the biblical account of the heavens and the earth is not some primitive co cosmology that uh, was made up by primitive peoples years ago, but rather it is based upon fact, and it agrees 
well with the, with the scientific evidence that is in the world today, that our argument isn't that uh, the Bible is, uh, su- supersedes scientific fact. In fact, basically, whether you're a creationist or you're an evolutionist, you're looking at the same set of facts. What really differs is how do you interpret those facts? And part of what I've been doing through this series of studies is trying to really emphasize that and point out that there is really good evidence and good arguments and plausible things to secure our minds and our hearts in the authority of the Word of God that we might let us speak to us in how we live our lives. Because there's kind of a a domino effect in all of this. If you begin by saying, well, we can't really rely upon the book of Genesis or at least the first two chapters or things of that nature, where do you stop then? Because what I found even in my own self, when I first got saved, I was, you know, raised an evolutionist. That's what I studied in school. And I thought, well, nobody in their right mind would believe anything other than that. And so as soon as I came across something in the Bible that I didn't understand or agree with, I, might, I could right away say, well, that's probably not part of the Word of God either, and I'll just mark that out. And suddenly you give yourself permission not to really embrace the whole Word of God. So what we're trying to do is essentially under, uh, put a foundation under that that helps you to at least provoke you to do deeper study on your own and consider the realities of things. So having said that, of all the advances in modern science and, and modern knowledge in the last 50 years, There's probably nothing has caused and been more problematic to the evolutionary theory than the field of genetics. And you have to understand that genetics is a relatively new school of thought. It's only something that's really blossomed within the last few years. And the advances in genetic research are just simply astounding when you begin to look into it. And and, and it becomes important because what the Bible clearly states that all of life, particularly human life, began instantaneously by caveat of the divine God. God, in a creative act, said, let there be, and suddenly, there mankind was. That it wasn't something that evolved over a long series of time. And there are a lot of different reasons why that becomes important, but I would say that it's plausible It's plausible to believe in an instantaneous creation because of what we see in the universe around us. I don't know if you're aware of it, but you have 22,000 genes, someplace between 22, 25,000 genes in your body. That's those, those are the genetic programming. And, and in present, that's the same it has been throughout all human history. Similarly, when you talk about a basic bacteria, from which an evolution would say that all human life evolved from a basic bacteria, well, a basic bacteria has 500 genes combinations inside of it. So the human has 22,000. We are far more complex than a basic bacteria, at least unless you're in politics and then you're, you're on the other end. But, but here's why this ma- matters. And one, one scientist put it this way. He says, there is no genetic mechanism that adds a gene. In other words, mutations can change an existing gene usually not for the better, but nonetheless, it can change it, but it never adds a gene. So one of the basic problems that evolutionary science has is if we started as a primordial ooze or a simple cell or a simple bacteria, in order to evolve into who we are, there would have to be this addition of genes from 500 to 22,000. And yet, There is no mechanism that we've ever been identified in science for that to happen. There's just simply no evidence that it has ever happened. And so as a result, either mankind and every other creature on the planet was created full formed with the full complement of your genetic makeup, or you don't exist. But there's no transitional phases. So often we talk about, well, there's no, there's no fossil transitions that we can look at and say, this is how people have, have uh, metastasized into what they are from simple animals. Or any other, that when we talk about the chemical makeup, the complexity of human chemistry is, is so amazing that the idea that it could just happen accidentally is, is, is ludicrous on its face. But even more basically, the whole idea of genetics is it's impossible for genetic, a, 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 a organism to add to its genetic makeup, we, no matter how much you want to do it. And so as a result, we realize that, uh, that we are who we are because we were made that way. Now, 
If you add to this the idea of the successful mapping of the DNA genome codes, uh, the Human Genome Project, you may have heard about it, but basically about right around 2000, they actually managed to map the entire genetic makeup of people. So that's why you can write to Ancestry DNA and they can send you your genetic makeup. And like me, you discover that your parents weren't telling you the truth. But uh, the bottom line is you, you get this you know, profile of who you are. How can they do that? It's because the, somebody, these scientists went through and it was an international project. They created this genetic map and we can, they can tell by the various markers in your spit you spit in the little tube. My wife gave me this for Christmas. You spit in the little tube and send it into them, and two weeks later, they send back to you a whole profile. This is where you're from. And I found out I, I wasn't where I thought I was from. But that's the simple reality of, excuse me, I turned my phone off here. Do you mind if I take this? No. <laughs> anyway, but what that led to was another discovery about human DNA that basically, as one writer put it, all homo sapiens, that's what you are, are descended from a hypothetical mother who they call mitochondrial Eve. Now, it's interesting that they would call her Eve because they're basically saying that every person on the earth has evolved from the same two parents. Now, according to... Uh, 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 well, basically, when you, when you read about this, they say, well, basically, this Eve lived somewhere between 100 and 200,000 years ago. Until 1997, uh, a group of researchers writing an article in Nature Genetics said what they found was, and I quote, that mutations of mitochondrial DNA occur 20 times more rapidly than they previously thought. So what did that do to the dating of the age of mitochondrial Eve, our forefather, our, our, for, our parents and our, our original mother, it reduced it from 100 to 200,000 years down to 6,500 years ago. And uh, it, it's really kind of interesting because that's kind of about the same time we're talking about the biblical account of the flood. In fact, it, it kind of confirms what Paul said in Acts 17, 26, when he says, from one man, God made every nation of men that they should, be, they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now, Paul is basing that statement on Genesis chapter 10. That's why he's drawing from it. And he basically says is the planet of the earth has been habit, inhabited by humanity, but we all started with one set of parents to become who we are. In a way, instead of calling it ancestral or mitochondrial Eve, it would be more appropriate to call her Mrs. Noah, because this is the, another thing that geneticists have, have looked at and are hypothesizing what they call a genetic bottleneck, and that's the idea that at some point in human history, the population of humanity upon the earth was reduced down to a few people. We call it the flood. They call it genetic bottleneck. Part of the question people ask, well, how is it possible that you could start with eight people 6,500 years ago and you could end up with a population of seven billion? Well, it's interesting because not too many years ago, there was a, a, a study that was done by Rutgers University in which they looked at the population of indigenous Americans in America, North and South America, in 1492. In other words, when Columbus showed up, what was the population of the, the North American continent? And they said, they found that uh, it was probably around 10 million people lived in the whole North American continent. We call them indigenous or native, native Americans. But they also found when they looked at the mitochondrial DNA that that 10 million people in 1492 all had descended or come from 70 individuals who went across the Bering Sea and came down to North America. So from 70 people, they, we, we find that by the year 1492, there were 10 million people. And today, there are someplace roughly between 50 and 100 million people who are the ancestors or the descendants, I should say, of the original inhabitants of America. So basically, we as human beings are, are pretty productive. Now, the world is going through an interesting thing right now because we always talk about, hear about, especially out of the UN, about the problem of overpopulation. What you have to understand is right now, the world's population is not increasing, it's actually decreasing. 
And particularly in the Western world where we went from having five or six children per family to now we're down to 2.2, you get to 2.1 and that's just enough to reproduce the number of people who live here right now. You drop below that and the, actually the population begins to decrease. And that's essentially what's happening in most of the world. Uh, as people migrate towards major metropolitan areas, they start having smaller families and worldwide population is actually on the decrease right now. It's not on the increase. But up until recently, we found that people are pretty you know, productive. They have lots of kids and they reproduce very, very fastly, very fast. But, you know, prior to the use of DNA and genetic measurements to track and map people, what most scientists relied upon was linguistics or the study of language. And they developed it quite a ways in, in terms of how are different people related in, this, in, in the sharing and the changing and advancing of languages. And what they had concluded is that there was in the beginning one original language. Now that's an interesting conclusion. They, I mean, these are not guys who are trying to support the Bible. They just basically said all the evidence says that all language comes down to the same basic original origins. And it's interesting because when you read the Bible, you never hear any comment or reference to racial groups, but you hear a lot of comments to nations and languages. The ancients saw people not by the color of their sin, but by their, their ethnicity in terms of their culture and their nationality, and they saw them in terms of the language differences, but they seemed to be fairly colorblind. They seemed to understand what we know about the Bible, we've known from the Bible for a long time, is that there's only one race in the world, there's not many races, there's one race, it's called the human race. We just come in different flavors and, and tones, but we're all basically the same, and uh, that, that, that idea that we are different is really kind of a primitive thought at this time in, in this age. But it's interesting because out of that original mother language, they said there are basically three main families of languages. The first is what we call the Indo-European language. And this is kind of surprising to people because our English is part of the Indo-European tree of languages, but so is Hindi in India that the Indians and the Iranians are part of this Indo-European uh, nationality, or I should say a group of languages, that all of these languages have simply changed and, and migrated over the years. Most of us have some experience with how language changes. Because I remember when I used to, my kids started talking about certain things being really sick. And I always thought sick meant that you were ill but I began to find out that sick actually meant it was really good. And there's a whole lot of these language changes that keep on going on that change the way that we express ourselves and they become solidified and the meaning becomes completely different. One of the reasons that you have Bible translations every so many generations is because language is static. So that there's some people saying, well, I, I only study the King James, the King James only, and that's because they've never read the 1611 first edition of the King James because it's virtually impossible to read. It's like reading Chaucer or Shakespearean English in the original form. It's, it's closer to German than it is to English. And if you have a text like I do and you read that original text, you just realize this is completely different than what we have. Words take on different meanings so that when they talked about somebody's conversation, they were talking about their lifestyle. We simply relegate it to our words that we share with another person. So one of the things they, they do is they try to trace and follow the way that language has changed through the centuries and the generations, but they find it not only comes from one original source, but it branched off into three different branches, Indo-European that we're familiar with. There's the Sino-Tibetan, which is the language of most Asian people when we talk about China and Korea and Japan. And then there's Afro-Asiatic, which is, includes all of the Semitic languages so that when you think about Hebrew that's spoken today, its roots are really connected to the way they speak in the D Dometic or, or Egyptian dialects and also the African dialects are all related to the same Semitic heritage. 
So that, uh, and what gets really complicated about this, obviously, is that as people migrate away from each other and become isolated, they begin to develop their own phrasing, their own vocabulary, their own way of expressing words. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Nell, which Jodie Foster stored in years ago about a girl who was locked away in the mountains with her mom, and her mom had a stroke, and her mom spoke with a a, 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 a a uh, speech impediment because of it, and she grew up, that's the only language she ever heard, and so she spoke in that same altered speech because that's what she is supposed for. And it's an interesting story because what it does really reflect what is the reality that we adopt the linguistic patterns and sounds that we hear. In fact, one time when I was in India, it was very fascinating because I, I spent a lot of time in, in uh, the state of Kerala, which is the southernmost tip of India, and they, they speak a language called Malayalam, and Malayalam is a tonal language, and a tonal language is one that you have to, to, to be able to speak it out of your sinuses. I mean, literally, and, and I, even the village where I was staying, I couldn't pronounce the name of the village properly. Because I would read it and say it the way it looked to me, and they say, no, 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 it's, this is what it is, and I couldn't even, I couldn't hear it, because if you don't learn that language by the age of five, you'll never speak it, because the receptors in the brain close, and you're never able to learn that language. That's why we teach our kids uh, languages, foreign languages, when they get into high school, which is probably one of the least informed things we can possibly do, because by the age of 12, you can learn a language, but you'll always speak with a distinct accent. If you want to be able to speak a foreign language without an accent, you have to learn it before the age of 12 and hopefully before the age of 5. One of the missionaries that I was spending time with told me, he says, my daughter, 5-year-old, goes out and plays with these kids. She comes home speaking Malayalam without an accent because she's just playing with these kids and she absorbs the language. And even if she were to go back to the States, which eventually they did, she would still have those receptors open in her brain and she would be able to do it without flaw. So I grew up in a home where, at least my grandparents' home, where they spoke German all the time, and I never learned German until I went to high school, and my German prof would say, how is it that you can speak German without an accent? And I thought, I have no idea. Do I get a better grade? <laughs> can I skip homework? But it was just those receptors were activated as a small child, hearing it spoken around me, and as a result, it just was easy so I could hear those words. When I went to Russia years later, they just finally said, stop trying. <laughs> you, I'd say, no, this is what you're saying? No, this is, and they finally said, no, it's probably better. We'll translate for you. It's, stop trying, because it just, you just can't get close to it. So I, I say all that because I think when we begin to understand how, how fluid language is, we realize that you can follow it out as these scientists have done for, for centuries now. And they begin to find, as we look at it, that it mirrors the patterns of the scattering of the peoples as is indicated here in the 10th chapter of Genesis. Now, one of the things I'll, I'll, I have to say so that you can keep the context, because part of the thing in your brain is going, well, why in the world is this even here? And the reason that this information is here in chapter 10 is because what we find in chapter 11 where it talks about the Tower of Babel and the dispersing of languages across the face of the earth. And so what he's doing is he's giving us the background before he tells us the full story. But what we find is that the descendants of Japheth, when they finally began to disperse around the earth, settled in what we would call the, the European part of the world. But also, not only did they go through Turkey, modern-day Turkey, up into what we call Europe, Greece, and so forth, but they also went uh, east and south inhabiting places like Persia and Afghanistan and migrating all the way to India so that those languages have that same roots that travel all the way. The same way when we talk about the descendants of Ham, they migrated south into the land of Canaan, which was, of course, the land of Canaan or Palestine was called Canaan in biblical times because the Canaanites lived there. But also, all the descendants of Ham, which we look at the, uh, the Egyptians, who actually you read, we read about Mizraim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt today, as well as Libya. And interestingly, it says that Kaftor, which was really the, the location of where the Philistines originally came, we often identify them with the Greeks, but he says, no, they're actually descendants of Ham, who later re-inhabited the land of Gaza and Canaan uh, even to this day. But finally, he, he really starts 
with Japheth and Ham, but he's really trying to focus in on Shem because Shem is the forefather of Abraham. And really, when we get into chapter 12, or the chapter 11 and chapter 12, we move into the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and all the way down to Jesus. So it's trying to show us this genealogical pattern that began to develop way back in that time. So the area of Babylon and, and Assyria were part of Mesopotamia. In fact, Ezekiel makes the comment about the Israelites. He says, your father was an Amorite. Well, who was the Amorites? The Amorites were the people who lived in, in Mesopotamia. Have you ever heard the name Hammurabi? Hammurabi's Code? It's in the Louvre in, 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 uh, in Paris. It's, it's pretty impressive. I've been there, seen it. Of course, you can't touch it, but here's this whole legal code written in 1800, 18 B, 1800 BC, 1800 years before the time of Christ. It has this whole legal code by which he ran his, his kingdom, and Hammurabi was an Amorite. And so the Amorites settled in Mesopotamia, and they eventually, when Abraham left, he is a descendant of Shem. He's of the Amorites who is moving into the land of Canaan, which is, are the descendants of Ham. And, and so it creates a, an interesting difference because as we get into looking at the names and the meaning of these names, it really reveals not just who they are by identification, but, but some facts about them. For example, the Japheth, he says of Japheth, I will enlarge your territory, or literally the Hebrew word means spaciousness. And when we look at where Japheth goes, we see them spreading out into a large area, reaching all the way into our own nation as well. We are descended from Japheth. We are what's called the nations. In fact, the word Gentile, literally in Hebrew, means nations. In other words, the, the biblical view is there's two groups of people. There are Jews, descendants of Shem, and then there's Japheth. <laughs> and those are the Gentiles and the nations around the world. But also, the, when we look at the descendants of Ham, the word Ham literally means in Hebrew, hot. And it's interesting because the Hamites become, for, to a large degree, the dark-skinned people because, as we talked about last week, what causes different skin colors? And, the, and it's really the, the response of the melanin in your body to sunlight so that a darker skin has more melanin, and melanin protects against skin cancer. So if you live in a sunny climate, you want to be able to block against that, that sun so that you don't develop skin cancer. But if you're living in the north country, if you're living in Norway, you don't need melanin because you have no sunshine. You know, and as a result, what happens is you want to be able to have your skin really receptive to what sunlight you get because sunlight adds vitamin D to your body. Have you ever wondered why it is that in the summertime when it's sunny, you feel energetic and you feel kind of positive and you're just excited and life is worth living? And then you come to Spokane in January and you're wondering, why am I so depressed? <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it has a lot to do with sunlight. In fact, uh, I noticed this moving from California up to the Northwest. I began to go through these winter blues. And one thing you know that if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to have the blues, right? <laughs> People will judge you harshly if you're depressed. So, but eventually I bought a light. I buy, I have a light every morning. I get up and I turn that thing on and I sit and read my Bible in front of this light which radiates vitamin D into my body and that's why I'm such a perky, happy guy all the time. <laughs> but you understand that your body actually has been created by God with these, this ability, these sensors, if you will, to be able to adjust itself to the environment. And so when you move into the warmer climates of Africa and, and places like that, if you have a, a, a lot of melanin, you're going to live longer, healthy, and reproduce after your kind. If you have low levels, you'll probably develop skin cancer or some other malady very early in life, and you won't last very long. On the other hand, we find that oftentimes people who come from climates where, where it, there's not much sunshine, they begin to struggle because their body is blocking a lot of the vitamin D that would naturally come by sunlight. 
And so these things are interesting. They're fascinating because prior to our modern time, people pretty much located and stayed where they were located. You lived where you grew up. You experienced that environment, and there's not even an, an, a sense of change that you go through. But now we are so mobile and we travel all over the world and we relocate all over the world that we're beginning to discover these kind of problems associated with the fact that our body is not reacting in a positive way to these changes of climate. Well, that's more information you probably ever wanted to have. But it gets down to something we touched on last week and I want to reiterate again. Is it the idea that the concept of race is not a scientific concept, it's not, even, it's not a biological concept, it's, and it's certainly not a biblical concept. Uh, there's no mention, as I said before, of race or racial differences in the Bible. Not even the concept of race is even implied in any, diff- any place in the Scriptures. In fact, that idea is a purely arbitrary, invented idea based simply upon outward appearance. But there's nothing real in terms of the difference. It's interesting that God says to, to Samuel, God, man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. The reason that God doesn't look at the outward appearance is because he knows the outward appearance doesn't mean anything. In the same way that some people may have different tones of their, of their skin color, they, they also have different shaped noses and different shaped heads and different kinds of hair and, and these kind of things which are as distinct and varied as anything else that you and I might experience. And yet somehow uh, people began to, in the modern world and especially in the early days of, of evolutionary theory because where racism finds its foundation isn't in the Bible, as some people have argued, it comes from evolution. Evolution is, is the parent of racism. And that's one of the dirty little truths that, that you don't hear very often, but that whole idea of racial differences making people superior or inferior came out of and really found power in the whole idea of evolutionary theory or hypothesis. Basically, as I said, the body adapts as necessary. And it's interesting, we even see evidences because as, as archaeologists and, and linguists have studied the writings of a lot of different ancient cultures, one of the things that they look for in the 19th century and early 20th century, is there kind of some evidence of racial distinctions, you know, or that, that they had these mixed cultures? Because one of the things we know, for example, in the tomb paint, paintings of, of Seti I, who was the father of uh, the first, one of the first great uh, uh, pharaohs of the new kingdom, the father of Ramses the Great. He had on his tomb tomb plate, he's he's got a picture of a Libyan, he's got a picture of a Nubian, he has a picture of a Semite, or somebody from Israel, Canaanite, because that's typical Canaanite garb with those multicolored robes, and he has an Egyptian. And what he shows in these tomb tomb paintings is that there is no distinction between people in terms of skin tone. They're just integrated. So we really believe and have a lot of evidence to support that the idea of racial distinction in the ancient world just didn't come up. In fact, it's interesting. Most people don't realize that Moses' second wife was an Ethiopian. And David had Ethiopians in his army. So we, again, and it's not... It's not indicated because they're a racial difference. It just tells us where they came from. They came from the land of Cush, which is modern-day Ethiopia today. And it's interesting when you go to Israel and you see a lot of Ethiopians in Israel today, they are Ethiopian Jews. They're Ethiopians they found who were worshiping according to the Mosaic, the five books of Moses, keeping the Sabbath, following the Torah, uh, living by the Ten Commandments and the other teachings of the Old Testament law, who were actually living in Ethiopia. Now they're basically full participating members of the Ethiopian community. There's even Jews from India. They even found a synagogue in, in, the, in the town of Cochin. Uh, I've been there, seen it, and... Um, So we find this dispersion all over the ancient world, but the distinction was it didn't matter, and it still doesn't matter today whether people are of one race or another. It's basically their religious lineage that becomes an identifier of whether or not you are a Jew by the recognition of the state of Israel. But um, in this account, there are also two particularly important standouts. We might, theologians call them oftentimes theological parentheses. In other words, we're reading the story about this person, this person, and all of a sudden, it introduces to us a guy by the name of Nimrod. 
Now, what's interesting, if you look up the word Nimrod, it depends on whether you use the biblical meaning or the modern meaning. Uh, <laughs> the biblical meaning is, you know, he was a, it says what he was a mighty warrior uh, or mighty hunter and a mighty warrior or hunter before the Lord. Um, in English today, a Nimrod means a dimwit and someone who's not very smart. So we don't really use it to, by its true meaning. That's another example of how words can take on to completely different meanings. But it's interesting that it says, again, that Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mightier warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and that's why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, in Shinar, and from that land he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh. Now, Nimrod's mentioning here is undoubtedly because of the nation that he founded plays a very important part in the history of Israel, that Babylon and the Assyrians, well, Isaiah described him in Isaiah 10.5 as the rod of God's anger in whose hand is the club of my wrath, that God raised up the Assyrians and later on raised up the Babylonians, Babylonians first to Assyria to bring judgment on Israel and uh, the northern kingdom, and later on Babylon came in and judged the southern kingdom of Judah. But also that we find that what's implied here is that Babylon becomes kind of the embodiment of false corrupt religion. In, in Revelation 17.5, it's referred to as Mystery Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. In referring to him as being prostitutes, he's not talking about a sexual way. He's talking about spiritually, they have prostituted their faith and their religion. But lastly, and most significantly, Babel becomes the fountainhead, not only of the scattering of languages, but the fountainhead of false religion that arises as a result of the influence of Nimrod, or at least that's what the Josephus, the Jewish writer, tells us. Um, and again, in chapter 11, we'll get into the confounding of the languages <coughs> from the Tower of Babel. But uh, what we find is referring to as an antagonistic kind of idolatry that is essentially an outgrowth of Nimrod's very character because early Jewish sources say that the way this should be translated, and I don't know why modern English translators don't render it this way, but the word before the Lord is the Hebrew word in, is in your face. And it means against the Lord, in opposition to the Lord. So he became a mighty one, a mighty warrior, but he is an antagonistic towards the things of God. In fact, we might better translate it that he was against the Lord and he lived in opposition to his will. And this is kind of thing that Josephus tells us in his text because he writes <clears throat> back in the first century, A.D., he says, now it was Nimrod who excited them, that is the people, to such an affront and contempt of God, that is to build the Tower of Babel. And he was the grandson of Ham, the great-grandson of Noah, a bold man and of great strength. Keep in mind, descended from Ham, whose son was Canaan, who rebelled against the Lord and dishonored Noah. He says, he persuaded them not to ascribe it to God, that is the glory to God, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured, procured happiness. The secret of happiness is inside you. Just find that inner Nimrod and you'll be happily ever after. <laughs> he goes on, he says, he also gradually changed the government into tyranny. He became a dictator seeing no other way of turning them from the fear of God, but to bring them into constant dependence upon His power. He also said He would be revenged on God if He should have a mind to drown the world again. For that He would build a tower so high that the waters couldn't reach it and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So what jo Josephus is saying is the purpose of the tower was to basically, if God ever wants to destroy the world again, we'll just climb to the top of the tower and, and we'll wait it out because he's not going to be able to do it again. But it's this, this rank rebelliousness against God and this rejection of his authority over their life that becomes really the characteristic of what follows after. It's interesting because... He, he's the founder of the city of Babylon. And again, as I said, Babylon becomes almost a synonym for spiritual rebellion and disobedience against God. If, uh, if one actually compares the, uh, 
um, oh, excuse me, there's a second individual that's pointed out here as well, and that's another parenthesis by the name of a guy named Peleg. Now, don't go there. Uh, <laughs> It says in verse 21 that Shem, the father of Eber, which is where we get our word Hebrew, two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided. Now, not too many years ago, as people began to discover the idea of continental shift, that basically at one time all of the continents were one and they've split apart, and they thought, well, that must be referring to these things happening. The problem is... Uh, for the earth to split within the era of what we know as uh, civilization and mankind, it would be as cataclysmic to the earth as would be uh, Noah's flood. And it's more likely that that severing or splitting of the continents and the creating of the oceans happened as a consequence of the flood, not by something else that happened during the days of, of Peleg. But I think it's interesting because he's probably referring to not the dividing of the soil, but the word eretz or land can refer to not only a physical location, but it also refers to a people or nations of people. And it may be simply saying it's the separation of the nations happened in the lifetime of Peleg. Now, Peleg is a grandson of Noah. He lives 239 years. And there's something interesting because when you look at the ancient uh, records uh, of the first kingdoms that we know historically, the founding of Babylon is, is noted as being 2234 B.C., 2,234 years before Christ. At that time, Peleg would have been 13 years old. When you look at Egypt, which follows later, uh, uh, not too many years later, in 2188, he would have been 60 years of age. And when Greece is first established as a kingdom and as a separate power, it's 160 years after the age of Peleg. And so in a very literal sense, he may say, be saying that in Peleg's day, the nations were divided and separated into their different empires. So that when we look at the ancient world, there are three great defining empires, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and of course, last of all, the, the Grecians. But here's also something interesting about Babylon. Babylon, archaeologists and historians tell us, is the first recorded kingdom which existed and, and it's basically its source of revenue was war and conquering other people. They were the first military complex that the Assyrians built their kingdom and their whole culture was built around the idea of conquering their neighbors. And what followed after that, of course, was uh, the Egyptians did pretty much the same thing eventually, and so did the Greeks. But they are the ones who first and very aggressively began to use warfare and conquests as a way of fueling their economy. And that's one of the reasons why the Assyrians were always so deeply hated and resented. And in fact, the Babylonians lived under the whip of the Assyrians for a very long period of time. But I think also it's, it's interesting that these three great cultures, which are the oldest empires of the ancient world, I mean, we can trace back the earliest evidences of civilization to Mesopotamia, to the Sumerians, and which eventually became Assyria and Babylon, that each of them has not only radiated from this area of Babylon into the various directions they went, that the Greeks went, were the peoples who radiated out of Babylon and went west and north, and the Hamites or the uh, Egyptians were the ones who went east and south and ha inhabited northern Africa and on down from there. But also, they each had their own unique language. So when we think about the, the, the Tower of Babel, sometimes I think we think that as we have today, like we have 4,000 different languages on the planet today, and uh, not including Ritzville. We have 4,000 different languages in the world, and, and we think that the Tower of Babel, suddenly they separated because they're all speaking thousands of different languages, when in fact, it's more likely that they just simply started with three different languages. So the Babylonian language is unique, and they had their own form of writing. Their language was basically written in what's called cuneiform, Arcadian cuneiform. It looks like somebody left wet clay on the ground and chickens walked across it. Uh, but it's actually, you see up here in the, in, in the left-hand corner, it looks like these little etchings, but this is a whole language that was communicated, and very important things were transfer, transmitted based upon that. That was their alphabet. 
Uh, the Egyptians, who spake, spoke what we call a Dometic language, uh, translated that into what is, we know as hieroglyphics. And again, this is a pictographic, excuse me, this is a pictographic language, which means rather than writing little figures and marks, they actually drew pictures that came to mean different things. Uh, and then we have the Greeks using what's called linear A and later on linear or B, which again is a completely distinct and pictographic language in linear A that was, uh, they, it, what's interesting about it is we don't know we have, we have linear A text that goes back to the, the, the Mycenaean kingdom, but nobody has been able to figure out how to, how to translate it. We don't understand what it meant because we have no connective language to, to connect it to us. So we know the Greeks started with a completely separate and unique language from that of the Egyptians or that of the, uh, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians so that you find repeated in this whole story this, this threes. You have three sons who had three uh, great, ba great migration movements, speaking three languages, fathering three groups of people with different cultures and so forth throughout history, which is simply what chapter 10 tells us. Confused yet? Okay. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, really begin to grasp, even in a little bit, and to begin to appreciate the, 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 the amazing information that this 10th chapter of Genesis contains. And sadly, uh, there hasn't been a great deal of research on this chapter by theologians and others, Lord, but it's such an important thing to recognize that it's here for a reason. And there's a message that you're communicating. And, and I pray that we would just begin to realize that everything that you said happened the way you said it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please?